Okay, we're back. We're live, the five o'clock show. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Tech Tech Talks uh, with our scientist, our chief scientist, Mike DeWert. Hi, Mike. Thanks for coming down. Oh, hi, Jay. Thanks for uh, letting me come down <laughs> to my home office. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me give you my thoughts and in, in introduction here. You know, a lot of confusion out there, um, and yet this is the most important thing happening in the community in terms of you know, a medical experience, public health. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Donald Trump has done a fabulous job in confusing everybody. He's made all the wrong choices. Um, and he's got a, a kind of, um, a kind of uh, um, musical chairs arrangement going on with the CDC, the NIH, his mi mi mysterious task force. Um, where is Dr. Fauci? Uh, where is Deborah Birx? Um, the, the whole thing is like a, it's, you know, it's like a reality show, but it isn't helping us at all. And there's a fragmentation all around the country in policy. And most recently, it's, it's been revealed that he doesn't want to have testing because testing reveals too many cases. And, and he's, you know, he's fooling a lot of people. It's, a, it's that Huey Long kind of um, demagogue thing that's fooling a lot of people. And, and one day, hopefully, they'll wake up and realize that you can't fool all the people all the time. But for now, He's fooling at least a lot of a lot of people, and at mm. least some of the time. So um, you know, science science should prevail here. Uh, we, we're, our numbers are still going up. We're still number one in the world, um, and we have to take stock of what we have learned, what we are doing, not only in the national ex examination of it, but also in the local examination, because there's a lot of confusion here too. Uh, it's really sad the United States uh, can't do better, but here we are. And uh, at least we want to talk to every scientist we, we can, especially you, about you know, where the science is going, what we should know from it, how, should, how we can use it to personally protect ourselves, um, and what it suggests for the future in terms of the pandemic. Um, I think we can never forget this is happening. We can never be complacent, never turn our backs, never go light on it, and certainly never reject the science. So uh, Mike, we're gonna talk, talk about the science today. We're talking about what we have been learning and maybe what individuals and for that matter, government organizations, even health departments can learn uh, from the examination that you and other scientists make. So uh, since our last discussion, uh, what should we update in terms of the science? Well, there is some new data from India. I don't know if you saw it. Um, it's a new research on face shields and mask slide that uh, they sent these healthcare workers out into homes in India to interview people and to check on SARS-CoV-2. And um, they, um, what they found was that when they sent them out first, they sent them with personal protective equipment, face masks, you know, like we all been wearing, and um, proper hand washing and all that. And they, of the uh, 622 workers they sent out, uh, 12 got sick. And they, they visited 31,000 people, uh, 222 people in those homes that they visited got ill. Uh, 12 of the healthcare workers got ill. Fortunately, none of them died. So they reset the whole program and rethought their protocols. And one thing they added was these uh, face shields that we're seeing around now. After the face shields, they sent 50 workers back out and they uh, visited 118,000 people in 18,000 homes. And uh, in the course of that, uh, they found uh, over uh, almost 2,700 cases of the disease in the homes they visited, but none of the workers got sick. So they were having contact with more sick people, fewer of the workers got sick, none of the workers got sick when they added face shields to the masks. Okay, so let me now ask they, you some questions about that. How are the homes yeah. selected in the first case and in the second case? How, how do they select the home? Why were they going to those homes? Well, there were, this is a very poor neighborhood in India that had a high incidence and they wanted to try to do the contact tracing. So there were contact tracers trying to find out uh, where the disease came from and where it was going, um, which we could do more of here in the United States. But so they, and they, so they selected these high-risk homes. Um, these workers sort of lived secluded away from other people because they knew they were doing high-risk things. So they weren't going to get it from anyone except for the people they visited. And um, sure enough, in the first case with just face masks and gloves and hand washing, a dozen out of the out of the uh, 62 workers got it. Um, so let's, after, let's let's stop there for a minute. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I I have so many questions for you. Um, okay, so 
uh, just the, the masks, they, they all wore masks. They all went into homes with the possibility of COVID and a certain number came out with COVID. Right. And that, that confirms the whole notion that if you spend more than X minutes um, in the presence of a COVID infected person, uh, your chances are pretty good about yeah. getting it. And that's because what, the, the aerosol, the, the talking together, but if they're wearing masks, isn't oh, yeah. that reduced? Why, why is that? It's because the air, it. the air in the home or what? Yeah, so it does reduce it. But bear in mind, these uh, masks are maybe 90% effective if you just wear a mask. These 62 workers had contact with 31,000 people. And of those 31,000 people, uh, over 200 had the disease. So, you know, if you, so, yeah, they spent a lot of time, a couple hundred of the people they talked to had the disease. So it's almost like a one in three transmission rate. Hmm. Okay, uh, and then, and and then when you only got it from the symptomatic people. Yeah, oh, from symptomatic people. Not then when they added the details, they had contact with even more people. So, yeah, wearing a mask plus a face shield, for some reason, seems to be much more effective at protecting you, the, the healthcare worker, than um, wearing just a mask. So, a mask plus a face shield protected all the healthcare workers, even though they saw five times as many people. Now, the question is what is it about the face shield they didn't the study wasn't powered to actually determine what it is about the face shield that helps is it that you're not touching your face so much or is it that you're disrupting the flow of droplets that might get through your mask or or what is it and they need to do a follow-up study um, but for now i definitely whenever i go to the grocery store i wear a mask and a face shield now whenever i'm in a place where there's a lot of people um uh, that's it seems where, to be prudent. Yeah. Where do you get the face shield? Uh, yeah, I'm at a hardware store. I mean, yeah. this one I ordered from Amazon.com. You can get them at Lawns, I think, now. A couple of other stores. I've seen you know, them. If, if you have a decent mask on and a face shield, then, then the lesson of that would not necessarily be you're getting aerosol in your mouth and nose because you have the mask on. But uh, I wonder if it teaches us something about your eyes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and maybe, the, the, you know, that that's a, that's a weak point in terms of transmission. Right, because your uh, tear ducts drain to your nose. So if the virus gets in your eyes, it gets into your respiratory system. And uh, then you're off to the races once that happens. Um, but the study wasn't really designed to discriminate that, all those sources of transmission. So it does bear follow-up study to find out exactly what it is about the face shield that's helping. Um, Just wonder yeah. about, I wonder about glasses. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if anybody's done a study about that, but people who wear glasses and thus protecting their eyes from aerosol uh, yeah. and people who don't wear glasses, that, that, would, that would be useful to know if there was a yeah. difference between glasses and no glasses. Yeah, so if you, you have just these kinds of glasses, your regular prescription glasses, a lot of space around mm. for yeah, true. So yeah. It might not be as effective as, say, goggles full on, like safety goggles that seal around your eyes or a big mask that disrupts the airflow around your face completely. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, are people in Hawaii or on the mainland wearing face masks? I mean, I know it's it's useful. I mean, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous in hospitals in IC, uh, you know, units and all that. But um, you're probably the only guy in, in the food store that has a, a face mask, I mean, a, a plastic mask on. Well, I've noticed the checkers at Safeway here in Kaneohe, at the Safeway over by Windward Mall. There, a lot of them are wearing face shields and masks. So, and then they also have the plastic barrier between them and the customer. So they're, they're taking it a lot, they're taking it very seriously, uh, fortunately, because they see hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people every day. And uh, well, it, it's, it, what's interesting is that they've shown that those gator masks that are single layer cloth gator masks don't work. Um, they seem to actually break the drops up into big drops into many smaller drops and uh, a bigger cloud. So when you're Faced with these uncertainties, you just you know, do your best to understand the science and go with the best science you can get. What's, um, what's a right gator mask? It's two-layer cloth mask. What's a gator mask? It's a, 
it's one of those things that you see a lot of people wear where it covers your nose and comes down to your neck and sometimes they have like little designs on them um it's a, it's a single layer of cloth it's mostly meant for a like motorcycle motocross cyclocross to keep dust out of your face it's not really meant to really protect you from transmission of viruses it's just mostly for mm -hmm. dust protection you know like a cyclocross uh, well, you, you, you said in your slide here, the study should be followed up in a controlled uh, trial. In the meantime, it's probably more prudent to wear a face shield and a mask. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, I hope a lot of people watch this and follow your advice. Yeah. Um, yeah, we all have to find there. a culture. Yeah. We have to find a way of living, you know, and uh, this is a, a step in that direction. Step in the direction. I and mean, it's only a stop gap between that vaccine you know the vaccine is what we really really need and uh but it has to be a safe and effective vaccine um so there is another slide how effective a vaccine needs to be yeah um there's there was a study um uh, that actually a mathematical study that was published in jama and uh the um 80 percent a vaccine, um, if only 75% of the people get it, it needs to be 80% effective to shut down a pandemic. Um, and in order to, um, if, if only 60% of the people get it, it has to be 100% effective to shut down the pandemic. Now, 100% sounds high, but it's, you know, measles vaccines, if you get one dose, is 95% effective. If you get two, it's 99% effective. So, um, Vaccine is only good if people take it, but maybe we can vaccinate as few as 60% if the vaccine is really, really, really effective and still shut down the pandemic uh, It's already going. I, I still don't fully understand that. Suppose I'm in the 40%. I have not taken the vaccine. Right. And suppose you're also in the 40%. You haven't right. taken the vaccine. Right. And um, we were in a room together for an hour, yeah. breathing on each other or right. breathing, breathing into the room and it's hanging there in the aerosol. Um, I, I'm going to give it to you or you're going to give it to me or we're both going to give it to, to each other. You know, there will be transmission. It's, yeah. it's almost a certainty in the, that if we both have it, that this will be some transmission if we spend an hour in that room together, close. Well, yeah. So, yes, it's, there, is a, there is that problem that if you're, you, if you're an unvaccinated person or not immune person who's exposed to somebody who has a disease, you have a risk of getting the disease. So this this whole herd immunity problem. Um, like we showed before with the simulations I ran and showed last time, um, if you don't get 100% of the population protected, they will eventually get 100% infected if you have a constant reseeding of the disease from outside. So if, if you say Hawaii shut down coronavirus, there's no more local transmission, and then we let the tourists come back, and they come from places where they still have coronavirus, eventually we're going to get it. You know, you might be in that lucky 40%, but you're eventually going to be in the unlucky 100%. So that's the thing with the vaccine. You've got to vaccinate. You've got to be aggressive about trying to vaccinate as many people in the whole planet as you can. Um, because if we vaccinate at least 60% of the world population everywhere, then we can shut down the disease and make it extinct. That's what this study seems to imply. If it's a but but making it extinct is not immediate. Making it extinct will take some no, time. No, not immediate. It'll take time. Yeah, yeah and, and in it's the process, time. people will die. Additional people will die. Oh yeah, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. And you have to be vigilant about your protection. That's like polio. We've been in the United States. Polio is extinct, but it's not extinct in the world. Mm -hmm. And we're only a few wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan away from it getting into the, getting out of the control again. Um, on the other hand, we've made uh, smallpox extinct. It took until the 1950s to make smallpox extinct in the world, but we did. So there's not, there's no reason we can't make this disease extinct too. We just have to be willing to vaccinate everybody. And people about, have to, you know, have a vaccine you can trust. So I, the Russians come up first. I'm not sure they would trust their trial just because I know their top-down method of making decisions are highly motivated to paint a rosy picture for us. But I'll be very interested in reading the journal articles and see what the peer reviewers say. You know, they're doing the trials in Mexico. Did I did I tell you that? 
that during the trials in Mexico, we learned it from somebody in Mexico. And in fact, uh, AMLO, the uh, president of Mexico, um, is is involved in their trials. He's, he's taking their vaccine. Okay. I, I guess they had trouble finding any other place, um, but, but, but apparently the Mexicans are willing to do it for one geopolitical reason or another. It, who, is this the Russian vaccine or a different one? The Russian vaccine. Russian vaccine, that's interesting. Yeah. Interesting, they're willing to do it, but they're willing to take a chance on, well, good. Uh, well, I don't know if it's good. Let's hope it works. I hope the vaccine's effective, doesn't have too many side effects. You know, Lysiawana is a vaccine that has bad side effects and isn't as protective as you want it to be. Yeah. And like we say, it needs to be 80% protective. Yeah. It's like, it's like the, okay. it's like uh, um, the, yeah. one of these, one of these drugs that uh, Trump was uh, advocating for actually killed people. Hydroxychloroquine. And, yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh, troubling. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about mutations, Mike. You know, have you heard anything like that? Somebody was saying this is this is a, somebody who was a, somebody who was associated with the medical community was telling me that um, that there's there's talk about a mutation. And how do you tell a mutation? Well, the disease presents differently than it used to. Um, the, the, you know, the the symptoms present the the duration of the symptoms and the stages of the disease are different the damage it does to you different. Um, have you heard anything or read anything about that? I've read things, but I have not read anything that says they've definite, definitively identified a, a more virulent or more dangerous version of the disease. Uh, the thing about mutations is that they can work for or against the organism. They can make it more dangerous or they can make it less dangerous. Um, what we've seen with some diseases is that over time, the, if it's something that's got a very high fatality rate at the beginning, uh, ends up with a lower fatality rate after many, many generations of transmission because it finds if it doesn't, ki if it kills fewer of its victims, it can find more victims. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, well, you know, think about it. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, bubonic plague did not go away because because humankind found a cure. It just, it's like Trump said, although I never give him any credit on this. Uh, it's like Trump said, it'll go away. It'll, it'll disappear, is what he said. Of course, well, hey, you we know, the case- We can We're cure with antibiotics. Oh, but we that was in the 20th century. We get out of our houses and get, yeah. Once we identified the vector for the transmission of the disease and found that we can control it, um, we could control it. You know, it's, it's like cholera. We, you know, we don't vaccinate people for cholera. We just have good sewage treatment plants. So we don't die of cholera in the first world anymore. That's a serious third world problem. It's not a first world problem. Um, it's not magic, it's science. Um, uh, I'm reminded understood. of the, I'm reminded of the Pope. Sorry. In, uh, the Pope in Avignon mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, what, 14th century. Um, and they were having terrible problems with the plague. And mm -hmm. for reasons that were not clear scientifically, in his chambers, he built two fires, one at either end of the chambers, and he had them roaring all the time. I think probably the analysis was that the flames would help, or maybe the heat would help, the, or the hot air would help. But in fact, what was happening is that the fire was scaring the rats away. Ah, uh, and, and, that, and that's why the Pope survived without without being infected with the plague. <laughs> that makes sense, you know. Sometimes yeah. it's better to be lucky than to, than to have the right have the right hypothesis. It's just sometimes better to be just lucky. Yeah. Well, it's like research in general, isn't it? Sometimes it's trial and error, and you don't know Sorry. whether a given thing is going to work. But you wake up in the morning with a bright idea and you try it, and my my goodness, it works. <laughs> Yeah, like the British, uh, the British uh, doctor, or I think he might have been, been even been just a bureaucrat, who went to this area that had cholera, removed the pump from the well, removed the handle from the well, so nobody could use water from that well, and they had to go get water from a different well, and the cholera epidemic stopped, and thereby proved that it was uh. contaminating the water and spreading the cholera, but he also saved a lot of people's lives, 
And that one observation then spawned this whole line of investigation that now we, yeah, modern sanitation came about. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, what about, what about uh, you know, the vaccine? How are we doing it? You heard anything about that? I mean, it seems to me that, you know, we, we have so many shiny objects being thrown at us yeah, yeah. politically and um, geopolitically and I mean, I know, all these stories, lawsuits and controversies. I mean, it just goes on and on every day, all day. It's like Jerry Seinfeld said, the amazing thing about the newspapers these days is there's just enough space for all the news. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, but I mean, what, what what's happening? Because we we were just distracted with so many things, and and we should be following the you know the, the vaccines more carefully. I think, but we, you know, I haven't heard much about it. Uh, have you? Well, yeah. Well, I guess there's like dozens of vaccines in trial, maybe hundreds. Um, some trials are more advanced than others, like AstraZeneca, Pfizer. They have some pretty advanced trials. Moderna. Um, they're probably the three le the leaders, you know, Moderna and AstraZeneca, Pfizer. Um, the vaccines could be tested for sa safety and efficacy by the end of the year, but then how do you scale up? Um, there's, there's pharmaceutical labs in India that are able to scale up because that's what they do. They make a lot of a lot of doses of a lot of drugs for you know generic markets, and so it's if the world will cooperate with each other. And if the United States doesn't get all proprietary, so we got to make the vaccine ourselves, we could possibly, you know, middle of next year, have a vaccine that's actually safe, effective, and distributed widely, which is what we really need. We, we need the world to put aside this uh, pride of invention and, and just say, look, we're going to work. Whoever gets there first, we're all going to band together and get this out there to protect yeah. people. Well, what I hear you saying is that uh, maybe there's not not as much collaboration as there should be. Now, what, what's interesting is if you talk to a given scientist, and whenever I mean medical researcher, whenever I talk to them, I ask them, "Is are you collaborating?" And I get a I get a, a mushy answer because I want to I want to hear that he's collaborating with his fellows um, everywhere in the world. I want to hear that he's part of the altruistic groups. Uh, that compare notes every day, that get on the phone, email, share their findings every day. But I don't, I don't hear that. I don't think that's happening. Been, I, I say a lot of times I'm scared off by the way this administration has uh, treated the few that have been collaborating. Like there was that research group that was collaborating with the Chinese to study how coronavirus evolves in bats and how they can control that development in bats because bats were identified as a high risk organism for incubating these new novel diseases. You see that not just in China, but you see in Africa, Marburg fever and uh, other horrible hemorrhagic diseases. Um, and they were sent, sanctioned by the government. They were told that um, if they want to work with this lab in China, they've got to violate a whole bunch of Chinese laws um, in terms of disclosing information. That's like, okay. So they're just not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to work with the Chinese anymore. It's too bad because it slows it's down the spooked, process. You know? um, yeah. Well, and, uh, the, the other thing that's happened uh, only in, in the last day or so is uh, we find that the FDA, I'm sorry, well, maybe the FDA also, uh, the CDC, NIH has been compromised by the president. He tells them what, what, they, what they what should say and they say it. And then the medical community says, wait a minute, that's not true. Uh, and, and so now you have a yeah, crisis like, uh, of confidence. Yeah. yeah, like on the tracing and testing, uh, there's a slide up there about that, but you've got to test. You have to test asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people. Um, and, and your contact, if you don't test, everybody's been in contact with somebody sick, you can't do your tracing. You can't run the disease you know, down and prevent it from getting out and infecting more people. And this idea that the government can come out and say, oh, never mind the testing of the asymptomatic people, even though they might be carriers, if they're not sick, let's not test. And that's, that's crazy guidance that just came out today. Um, I saw it. So I'm, yeah. so I'm glad that uh, Mayor Caldwell is uh, saying that we're going to test more, trace more. Um, it's kind of late. I mean, we need to hire hundreds of, tra of contact tracers. UH has trained a bunch, um, 
I think that the most important skill for these contact tracers, well, A, they got to have enough training to know how to protect medical information. You got to pay attention to the HIPAA rules. But the other thing is they got to have a good ability to build a rapport with at-risk communities. You know, if, if you know that this virus is spreading, you know, in a Micronesian community, just for an example of one that is high risk, you want people who they trust. And people that they can say, if I tell this person who I've talked to, uh, will they, they, they won't do anything bad of that information. They really want to help. And that's a very, that's probably the most important skill. Um, but you look at the UH as a testing program and you've got to have a college degree and you have to have worked in a healthcare field. And that's pretty high bar. And in some of these underserved communities, you're not going to find a lot of people who actually have those qualifications to be trained. So I, I this that, is was a, that was a mistake. More. And one of the things that came out is that when they got all trained up at Manoa um, and, and they went down to the Department of Health to be deployed, the Department of Health said, well, you know, you, you had the training in Manoa, but you didn't have our training. You're not ready yet. You have to be yeah. trained twice. What's that about? Um, you know, yeah. it's completely disorganized. And then, of course, you had yeah. uh, those legislators who went to see, uh, find the tracers and uh, there, there were no tracers. I mean, a handful of tracers. When the government assured us there'd be hundreds of them, there were a half a dozen of them. Um, that whole thing was really, that's a crisis of confidence too. And yeah, the, yeah. The, the question is, how are we going to really proceed from now? And, who, and who's going to be doing, what do you want to call it, the uh, legislative supervision, you know, to keep them, keep them. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, take the executive branch these yeah. days and they're supposed to do stuff to you know, deal with a pandemic like this, and they don't. And then they give us, you know, information that's not accurate and not complete. And I think it's, you know, the Hawaii has not come out very well on this. No, we were doing so well, it seemed, for a couple of months there. And now it's like uh, doubling every 16 days or so. And, and that doubling rate, we're going to overwhelm the healthcare system in about a month. We're going to have every ICU bed full and we'll be having to turn people away who. Yeah, Queens Hospital. Queens Hospital used to have two floors dedicated to COVID. Now they have three. Mm -hmm. That's a serious yeah. increase. So what it's about serious. the tests themselves? You know, uh, we, we know that Ocean has developed the test, um, and that one's uh, pending FDA approval. I think mm -hmm. uh, we we talked to a guy in Michigan, a, a research scientist in Michigan here on ThinkTech, and um, this is also pending an FDA test. I don't know what the problem is with the FDA. I mean, uh, uh, can't we develop these tests and start using them? They're all stuck in the pipeline yeah, yeah. somewhere, including here. There's a lot of other tests that look for um, antibodies or antigens. Um, there's one test that's really fast that looks for the uh, pro antigens to the spike protein on the outside of the coronavirus. They don't need to tear the virus apart to look for, you know, something to latch onto. They just look for the spike protein. Um, those tests aren't as accurate as PCR. Um, they have a false alarm rate and they have a false, uh, a false negative rate. So the problem with the false positive rate is that every time somebody is positive, you've got to follow it up with an accurate test. And now that accurate test may take a couple of days, mm -hmm. but if there's a false negative, what that means is you need to be just testing people more often. If today's test is negative and you're positive, then maybe tomorrow's test will be positive and, and, you, and they'll find out. So that, that's, that's a problem with these antigen tests and antibody tests is that they're not as accurate as PCR. For some reason, FDA is holding the industry to an accuracy standard that's like 80% of PCR, which you know, it's in a, we're in a war with this virus. Maybe the 60% solution or the 70% solution is what we need until we get a, get a handle on a vaccine. Because right now, we don't even know how many people we have that are infected. We know we're undercounting. And there's some speculation that the government is deliberately undercounting. And they don't want to know. Um, I don't know if that's the case in Hawaii, but it looks like it's the case nationally. Yeah, it looks like it's a case in Hawaii, too. It really does feel the same way. Yeah. They haven't been testing. And, and it, it comes out that uh, Josh Green has wanted testing, more testing, and, and the governor and uh, the Department of Health don't. And it's probably for yeah. political reasons. 
But let, let me let me uh, give you a scenario, though, Mike. Um, so I, I haven't had this conversation with anybody. I would like to have a conversation like this just to learn what it's like. So you have some symptoms, or maybe yeah. you don't, but you feel that you've got to get tested. So you get tested. This is like you know, an awful medical experience. They tell you that you're positive. Okay? And, and maybe you're, you're also compromised in one way or another or in many ways. And here you are, you're okay. You know, it's a, it's a cold, you know, it's got, you've got some symptoms, but not much. Um, but th there's the prospect, there's, there's the prospect that, that you're going to get a lot sicker. You don't know that. Mm. Some people don't, but right. the possibility is there. How do you sleep at night with that kind of possibility on you? And furthermore, right. and furthermore, you know, you hear all this stuff about how the government's not being candid. The tests are not accurate. Um, you may have to get tested again. Maybe you should get tested again. There's all these vagaries and confusion points all swirling around you in a moment where you are completely stressed out. Um, yeah. You know, you are, you are terrified of the possibilities, sure. especially yeah. if you're compromised. Uh, and, you know, yeah. I think, I think one, one thing government should do is to try to give you consistent advice and right. to try to give you a regimen to follow where you can control it somehow and not, and not be terrified. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like if we find out, for example, that exercise, just get on the treadmill, keep your lungs clear helps. Maybe. I don't know. Not everybody can afford to put a treadmill in their home. Uh, there's some anecdotal evidence that that kind of uh, thing does help you keep, clear, keep your lungs clear of the COVID, uh, even if you've been infected. But those are just anecdotes so far. Um, there's a movement to improve the amount, the availability of treatment at home, where you can have home health. You can stay home, but get telemedicine or a visiting healthcare nurse come treat you so that you're not in the hospital where you might spread it around or expose more people just because you're out there traveling around. Um, and then you know, just stress management. A lot, the, the big problem with this disease is that if you test positive, you're quarantined for 14 days. That means you're not going to work. If you don't have the kind of job where you can work from home, um, even if you feel well enough to actually sit and to, to do your work, you can't work. So that's that's a problem. Um, and that's where we get a lot of essential workers. And unfortunately, it's the low wage workers that are mostly in that position. The grocery store clerks, um, the truck drivers, the people that don't necessarily make the most money are the ones that have to be out there to make any money. Um, so yeah, terrifying, that, I, terrifying. It's, it's a hard problem how not to solve it. You know, how, how do you how do you deal with the stress of that? And then if you're not sleeping, you run your immune system down. So now you've got a double double risk, you know, an extra yeah. risk there. Yeah. So. One last thing I wanted to ask you about it is uh, I saw this. I don't know if you saw it. You know, we heard a few months ago that it was all about um, a deterioration of your lungs. Um, mm. and uh, the virus would eat your lungs. And, oh, yeah. And uh, you need a ventilator, and there was this whole, whole political thing about the ventilators and the uh, Defense Production Act and all that, and, and too many ventilators here, too few there, um, people competing for ventilators. We haven't heard much yeah. about that. In fact, what I, what I last saw was that, you know, uh, the whole ventilator thing may have passed, and that what, what really happens here is, uh, is blood clots in the lungs. And uh, there are some doctors who are using uh, blood thinners to resolve those clots. And using that kind of technique, um, there's really no need for a lot of people for the crisis management with, with um, ventilators. Now, I don't know if that's so or who's using that, but I, I do operate on this assumption. And I, I'm really asking about this too, is that the doctors on the front line, healthcare professionals on the front line are learning um, in difficult circumstances, they are learning tips and tricks on how right. you deal with this disease. And they're better at it now than they were say 90 days ago. What do you think? It might be why our fatality rate in Hawaii is closer to 1% now than the, the 3% it was originally. Um, but we're also learning things that go the other way that we're learning that there are these long haulers you know something like 
And some studies is 30%, some studies is 90% of the people who get the disease and have symptoms don't get over the symptoms for months. Um, they various degrees of disability and illness, but um, these long haul cases seriously will impair people's ability to work and it'll seriously impair our economic potential. You have to be, you know, kind of mercenary about it. If you can't go to work and be, you know, highly efficient, then the gross domestic product will go down. Um, and that's something we've got to figure out, you know, how do, how do we, A, how prevalent is the, is the true prevalence of these long haul cases? 30% of the people that show symptoms, 90%, 10%. Um, and then how do we treat these long haul people to get them healthy again? Because um, this, this isn't just lung disease. This is a cardiac disease, a neurologic disease. Um, the, the, the number of organs this thing can compromise just seems to be everything practically. You know? And that's, that's, that's kind of the weird, scary thing about this, you know. And um, as, a par, as far as the bleeding in your lungs goes and the micro, you know, the little microscopic ruptures of your blood vessels that clog up your alveoli, um, Coumadin and other blood thinners, they have side effects. You know, they can cause brain bleeds. You could end up with a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, I would like before they switch from ventilators to blood thinners to see a, get in a large scale, I'd like to see a controlled trial. Um, treatment versus treatment with blood thinners versus treatment with a ventilator. Yeah. What's the survival rate relatively between those two groups? And yeah. I haven't seen anything published on that at all. One, one final public health issue is, uh, is that, okay, we're going into a kind of lockdown again. Okay. Um, to some people, it sounds irrational, you know, just to compare one aspect of the lockdown against another aspect. A friend of mine called me, he said he likes to go hiking. And um, so the lockdown keeps him out of parks. He can't go wow. hiking. Uh, <clears throat> and on the other hand, uh, you know, you can you can do other things which actually are more dangerous than hiking. Uh, right. So it, it's not clear who who helped the governor design this latest lockdown because mm -hmm. the parts don't necessarily comport on a rational basis. But my question to you is: Do you think all that we know now? And all that we know about the, you know, the multiplication effect of the infection, um, is this is this going to help suppress the curve the way it did before, or are people in a certain complacency now uh, where the lockdown isn't going to help that much? You have any thoughts about that? You know, the research is pretty clear that breathing heavy, coughing, talking, singing, are all risky things. You know, if you're outside in a well-ventilated area away from other people um, and you're just talking quietly to whoever you're walking with, you have somebody in the same household, risk is low. If you're outside exercising in a group of a lot of people, uh, risk is moderate. But if you're indoors doing that, you know, with poor ventilation, risk is very high. The MIT has done this study. Um, yeah, it's singing, oh boy, it turns out to be a really risky thing to do. Even outdoors, if you're singing with a group, that's, um, that's risky, mask or no mask. Um, so, so I guess the thing is, activities where you're yelling, like cheering at a game, singing, breathing heavily, um, talking loudly, um, you know, you, you, those activities are all risky. I don't know why hiking was banned, maybe because it decided the groups of two or two more, or two bigger than 10 and too many people were hiking together. Um, it seems like it's a low risk activity activity to me, uh, outdoors, well ventilated, group, small groups. Um, but you are breathing heavy and that does produce aerosol droplets. Um, uh, of course, swimming in the ocean, well, you're breathing heavy, but you're not, you're usually more than six feet away from anyone else. So um, that's, that's better. Uh, questions, there is a question whether six feet's enough or whether it should be 16 feet or 30 feet or something more. Um, that hasn't been settled, but still the distance Plus, avoiding the heavy breathing, the singing, the talking loudly, the cheering helps. Avoiding crowds helps. Mm -hmm. uh, use your common sense. And you know, if you can't avoid a crowd, wear your mask and face shield. And uh, don't sing. Don't be around people who are singing at you. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And, and, and stay out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, with everybody 
in a crowd uh, screaming at the top of their lungs, that doesn't sound like it's very healthy. We're probably going to see some effect over that in a couple of weeks. Like the Sturgis motorcycle rally, they've already identified 70 cases that have probably originated there. And it might just be the tip of the iceberg. And we never even know how many people Yeah, spread. right. Could be more. Yeah. Well, what okay, we have to. Go ahead. Go ahead. By the people that stormed the Idaho legislature demanding that they not protect them from coronavirus. These people weren't wearing masks, they were carrying guns, they were trying to intimidate the legislators. And that crowd of people put themselves and everyone else at risk. Yeah, the uh, ultimate lack of consideration. Yeah, wear your masks, you know, avoid crowds, social distance. <laughs> it sounds like common sense. And apparently common sense isn't very common. No. If I go swimming in the ocean or a pool and I, um, you know, I'm, I'm shedding virus, th the virus doesn't survive in the, in the seawater or in the pool, does it? I don't think there's much evidence that, well, the pool's chlorinated, so that should pretty well take care of the virus. I'm not sure about the ocean, but I don't think there's a lot. Of, I haven't seen any evidence that, there's, that it survives in seawater very long. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a fragile virus. It really, really, really likes to be a human host. And, um, you know, even just a good soap and water dose kills it. I mean, you don't even need alcohol, really. Alcohol is a good thing to disinfect with, but just wash your hands with soap and water kills the virus very effectively. Yeah. Um, well, so. Mike, I, 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 we got to follow this. We got to follow the curve. But next time we talk, I'd also like to follow the, um, what do you want to call it, the uh, sociology of it. And how, yeah. how various things affect a curve that may that may be science, but maybe social science also. Uh, yeah, yeah well, social science is so much harder than physics. Tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might be quoted on that one, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mike DeWert, our chief scientist here on Think Tech. Thank you so much for coming around. Thank you. Aloha, stay safe. Okay. Well